Right now, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce one of the staunchest friends of Chobimala. Morton Crockfold has become part of our furniture. <laughs> he, he's here whenever we've had it, whenever, wherever we had it. And I'm a little bit jealous. As, as a teacher of Pachala, I like to think, you know, the students like me a little bit and whatever. And they do. They, but they say, yeah, you're our favorite teacher after Morton Crockfold. <laughs> so I know where my place is. And there is a reason for that, because there are very, very few people who can arouse the level of passion, have the level of energy, and can bring about the transformation within a relative short period of time that I've ever seen anywhere. Uh, a little bit uh, a blurb about him. He's a Norwegian photographer and writer. Uh, he's known for its portraits, wonderful portraits uh, of celebrities, famous people, but also of ordinary people. And he did mention, Graziella, that he wanted a special session with you. So you'd have to save your time. Yeah. Um, he's been appointed the Knight of the Order of St. Olav in 2005 and received the Hasselbad Masters Award in 2002. Um, he also set up the Nordic Light Festival, which I was very fortunate to go to, and really a fabulous festival where he gets absolutely brilliant people on a regular basis. Morten has had a major impact as a teacher in Norway and abroad, especially at the Academy of Photography at Vaga. Uh, let me turn this around. And he was appointed the Knight of the Order of St. Olav and received the Oslo Municipality Culture for 2004. Uh, but for me, what is really most important is Martin Krogvold, the individual, the person. Uh, we know the photographer, we've seen his great work. It is his ability as an individual to take ordinary people and transform them, that for me is quite magical. And I'll tell you a little story. Uh, of course, there are many students at Pachala and they've done very well. But in one of the workshops, one of the participants was uh, Moti, who's a caretaker at Pachala. And you will not believe the type of work that Moti came out with at the end of that workshop, which was exhibited with the rest of the photographers at the Asiatic Gallery. And that's the sort of thing that Morton can do. He's a magician. I present to you Morton Krogvold. Thank you so much, Adul. And uh, thank you guys for turning up. I'm very honored to be here, of course. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, Pachala and Rick. And I want to thank Shibli and Zazad, and of course, always Muti. But I have to thank you for the nice words, Shadul, but I have to go, give something back to you because um, we are talking a lot about you and we really care for you, all of us. And uh, I always said that you are the Nelson Mandela in photography. And I don't know uh, if you people here understand what great work Shadul is doing. Uh, he's, he is a legend all over the world. and. Uh, I'm so honored to meet you again. We had Shadul in the Nordic Light, and we of course gonna bring him back again. And his lecture is together, not because you are there, uh, here, together with Chris Rainier, the lecture that have received most reaction to me. Uh, Chris and Shadul, and Shadul, when you in the Nordic Light, started your lecture telling about the blind child. You took the essence of what photography actually is. And we had many great names, uh, but to have you and Chris as friends of the festival, or festival is the best that could happen to us. And I also would like to thank the, the poor students that maybe are out struggling. Maybe they hate me, but uh, that's okay. I'm gonna, uh, when Shadul wrote an email 14 days ago, I expect you to show some new work at Goethe's, 
And I said, fuck Goethe's, I don't, oh, is that again? And I don't want to show my new work because I've worked now for two years. Uh, and I don't show it to anything, uh, anybody because it's brand new and I don't know the quality of it because I'm experimenting more and more uh, in my Requiem project. But okay, Shadula, I, uh, I obey your orders. So I brought some, but not in the Requiem uh, project. I brought start, uh, I'm going to start with some mediocre work because it's not finished. But first, I will read a line or, or a quote from, uh, I guess, Shadul, since you know everybody. Uh, Robert Adams, you know also him. And he wrote something very interesting because uh, he wrote, there are reasons, of course, for the loss of a sense of community among photographers. For one thing, there are too many of us, and as we go out without work, the numbers who teach photography rise, and then they go, go unemployed, too. The money problem soars a lot. Not long ago, I discovered that it would be possible for me to earn an adequate living by lecturing about photography. At the same time, I knew that it remained impossible to survive by photographing, by doing what I was to lecture about. Irony of this sort does not sweeten life. And I, I think that's, uh, that is, of course, a problem when you teach young uh, photographers today, that um, it's less work. Marielle Mark told me that she has maybe two, three assignments a year, and she's so happy. James Nachtway, the same. Jean Richard, the same. The struggle to get assignments. So they teach photography. Um, in my workshop, uh, in Europe, I could have a workshop each week, three and, uh, I mean, 52 weeks a year. Uh, it's queuing up for the workshops all over. Um, but I do, don't do more than five. My audience is people that is 20, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, a good salary, good job, good family, happy family life, but are, miss something in life, really miss something in life, and they go into photography with a tremendous energy. And actually in Scandinavia now, I think the top people in photography is amateurs, but it's not these amateurs with a Nikon badge or label. They are investing all their spare time in photography on a very, very high level. Because I think in our time, people miss something. And uh, last night, I had a wonderful conversation with Judy Hines uh, about uh, this wonderful Australian presentation. Because some of the work that was presented is shown all over the world. They're doing it, Norway, Sweden, Germany, France, Vietnam, everywhere. Young people photographing people standing straight upside down, the bleach color, uh, color, nearly white faces, people without any expression, standing in front of a shopping mall or in the house, without any aesthetics because the storytelling is so important, but everybody does it. In every country we have it, and it's exactly the same. So I asked Jody why, and she didn't know, I didn't know, we're talking, are the generation lost, or are they sad, or they're not used to fight, I don't know. But it's so interesting to see that in Australia, do they, they do the, exactly the same thing in Norway, and it's quite far. So uh, maybe that is some problem also with a beautiful invention, the internet, that you see so much that you lose your originality. I don't know. I, uh, you don't need to like me. You don't need to agree with me. I question mark everything. You don't need to like my photographs. It, it doesn't matter for me, actually, because I know what I'm into. Uh, and I am not doing the trendy stuff at all. Uh, 
Jody Bieber's fantastic presentation uh, last night. Uh, great impact. I can never do that work because it don't interest me as to, uh, to do it. But I love that she's doing it. It's absolutely wonderful and so strong, and she's so brave. And then Jody said something that I absolutely agree with. She said many things. I, I really admire her. I have the same experience as Jody Bieber that young assistants are exhausted after one week, but we can go for month after month. I have to change young assistants every week because they have need to sleep for three days after uh, joining me for five days. And I'm 62. And it's no problem. I can go on and go on, no problem. And I don't think, of course, I'm lucky. But I think it has to do with love of the craft. I love it, what I'm doing. I think it's so difficult to take photographs. It's more and more difficult for me. Because I try to enter a new world. And that's the reason I dare not to show it. Uh, because if I get bad response now, it's so fragile, uh, my work. But if I'm invited back in two years, I can promise you, Shadul, that I will present the whole work here uh, in a show. Uh, because then I'm going to be finished with my Requiem pro uh, project. And the Requiem project is about a couple of lines uh, written uh, by uh, Secretary, General, uh, Secretary General in the United Nations from 1953 till his death in 1961, together with the Nobel Prize literate Per Lagerqvist. I haven't got the Per Lagerqvist translation in English, but I have the Dag Hammarskjöld that is based on my project. It's a new country in another world of reality than days. Or did I live there before day was? I woke to an ordinary morning with great light, reflected from the street. And it ends. The season has changed, and the light, and the weather, and the hour. But it's the same land, and I begin to know the map, and to get my bearings. That project is so difficult, and is so challenging. And I used, I started 12 years ago, and now it's really going. No, it's really the last two years. Um, <clears throat> but then I also have to read because uh, we have, uh, they make a, d a documentary about the workshop that they did two years ago also. And those guys that are filming us is amazing. They are so good and they are so present, these two filmmakers, especially the director. And he asked me a question today, you're teaching aesthetics, what, is, what are aesthetics? And I said, it's a very difficult question. I think it's very rare that some modern uh, contemporary photography lacks aesthetics because they try to break, break down the old tradition. Uh, no problem for me. I will not do that because I love tradition. But Henri Matisse, the painter, has said it better than anybody. Expression for me does not reside in passions glowing in a human face or manifested by violent movement. The entire arrangement of my picture is expressive. The place occupied by the figures, the empty spaces around them, the proportions, everything has its share. For me, that is so vital. Uh, and since I the only person that see my work now is some of the great artists in Scandinavia, and I, it's the top people in Europe, and some of the uh, novelists, writers. Be, I don't show it to photographers yet, because they are into the photographer's way of thinking. I always search for inspiration outside my own field. And when I show it to Karl Nejar, my good friend, he worked close with Pablo Picasso for 20 years. He did everything that Picasso did in small size. He did it in all the sculptures. 
he has been more together with Picasso than any other male person. And I have to say male person. When I show some of the contemporary work, photographic work, because he is also included in a book from 1966, the 10 most famous photographers in the world. Carl is there too. He think it's boring. He is into James Nachtway and immediately spotted James Nachtway, inspiration source is of course Goya, Francisco Goya, the Spanish painter. So when we had James in the Nordic Light, in the q and I could ask him, I said to James, I know your inspiration. And he said, okay, guess. And I said, Francisco Goya. And he said, of course, because we have to do geometry in the war uh, photographers. We have to do skill. We have to do light. We have to do beauty. In, because to show a terrible thing, you have to do it in a sort of be goosebump, beautiful way. Not beautiful, but elegant. I mean, craftsmanship. You have to do that. And my God, Chris is doing that. Um, and why is form beautiful? And beautiful, I don't mean beautiful as red roses or pink roses. Roberts uh, writes, why is form beautiful? Because it, I think it helps us to meet our worst fear. The suspicion that life may be chaos and that the therefore of sufferings is without meaning. For me, order in photography is so vital because it's totally chaos in my head. And because it's totally chaos in my head, I write every night and I buy special books in Italy. Of course, I write 95% uh, with a computer, but I use fountain pens. And a couple of days ago, Graziella had her uh, speech and showed her amazing photographs. Graziella, it took me three hours. I went to bed one o'clock, went up two o'clock and wrote from two to five because that's presentation and your, I, know, I knew your photography just hit me. Totally, because there it is. It's fantasy, it's heart, it's so lucky I'm to be invited to experience a highlight like this. And we are lucky, guys, to be here in this wonderful festival. Before I show uh, some of uh, my first mediocre work, work and so sorry uh, a little that I've shown before, I always get the uh, question, uh, do I have a digital camera? Yes, I have a digital camera. I don't use it that much. Uh, but I think if, if the digital camera can help you to express something or make you say something that you have not been able to see before, I'm all for it. I love gadgets. I'm all for it. Uh, but I love the dark room. I love the silence. And then I could put on some music after the silence. I love to be closed in the dark room, escape from the world. And I'm dark room sessions that last five, six, seven, eight hours. And then I do, as Paul Caponegro said, after five hours, you have to get a bottle of red wine and an apple and listen to Gustav Mahler maybe. I've always uh, asked my inspiration source, of course many photographers, many, many, but for me the main key is Lenny Bernstein, the conductor and the composer, because when I was a child and I was sick and I didn't, couldn't read before I was 11 because it was no education in the hospital. When I was 12, uh, my neighbor bought a television set and suddenly I saw Leonid Bernstein talking about the big, great composers to young kids, and I was a young kid. And suddenly I realized that that was the world I would like to enter. Or else, of course, it's Ingmar Bergman, it's Tarkovsky. And if you are not familiar with the great, great filmmaker, 
Sukhorov from Russia. Uh, if I mention Sukhorov to you and you don't know who that guy is, I've done you a great favor. And of course, Theon Golopoulos, Arshik Stern, and uh, when I uh, listened to, uh, to uh, Sostakovich reading Anna Akhmatova, Dostoevsky, Thomas Mann, and um, Sammy Beckett. I cannot do Sammy Beckett photo photographs because I'm not that person. I'm a quite simple person. But Sammy Beckett said once that, imagine this beautiful sunshine outside and you have a white day. And for him, a white day was white wine and white fish. I said, you enjoy the sunshine. But if you are going to, to create something, art, imagine that you have a black sun inside yourself that is so much more interesting and deeper and more powerful and more challenging is a black sun. And we know that is melancholy, that is a creative source. All good humor, Charlie Chaplin. I have photographed two persons that is very, very depressing. The one is John Cleese. He is the most depressed man I ever met. And Mr. Bean. Rowan Atkinson, he is down there. They are really, really struggling in their life. And they said, you have to be sad to make humor. I'm a very lonely person, and I have so many people surround me. I have the best family in the world, but I think also you have to be lonely to create. I enjoy to be lonely. I'm a very sad person, and I laugh three hours a day. Um, at the end, before I show my, oh, I hate showing my work, uh, I had to say that uh, it's also about reaching your childhood for me. And I try to encourage my students thinking, not cloning. And I try to tell my students here, don't look to New York City or Washington or Paris or London. Believe in the source you have here in Bangladesh. Believe in this great continent. All the great arts was created here thousand years ago. And in the West, if we want to see a photo photographer from Bangladesh, we don't want to see a cloning from New York City. We want to see one that gives us a sort of the Bangladesh mood. So don't imagine that the West is more interesting or more, more educated. I'm so proud to be here. And when, at the end, I will talk about uh, the childhood is, of course, you all know Helmut Newton, the erotic fashion photographer, portrait photographer. He was, just before he died, accused uh, for one thing. And uh, one critic said that, but your erotic fashion photogra photography re reminds us of, in the style of the Nazi propaganda from the 1930s. And he said, of course you're right. I was a young kid in Berlin in 1930. Of course it reminds me, because these guys were really good in doing film and photography, because it's my childhood. Shadul, I will show some of my work. Okay, promise. Could you, this is my ordinary work now first, because uh, since you asked me to show some new work and I was scared to death Microphone. because I couldn't show it, I would sh show, uh, then I made some test prints because I haven't, I haven't uh, started to uh, edit or print uh, my work of photographers that I meet I really admire. And thank you. Oh, I love you. And uh, Shadul, I have photographed you twice, but just for a couple of minutes. So I have to do a, a new portrait because I'm not pleased with it. Uh, I really want to photograph Judy as well. Uh, this is Marielle Mark. Uh, 
she was not very happy uh, when I photographed her, and I love that because I know when we are starting photographing, she will be happy. Uh, I started with that one. If you go to the next, please. Uh, I don't. She looks like Indian. This is just test prints that I made very, very fast to present. Uh, I'm more. Uh, I have not edited and I've not d d done any darkroom. But it's just to show uh, that this is a piece of work I'm working beside my big project, uh, Requiem. Next, please. Uh, and this is a very, very good friend of the festival. Uh, he, uh, you know, all of you know him. And uh, I think, think it's very nice that he sent me an email and said that that's the best photographs that's ever taken of him, he said. Because I love his face, he's, he's a terrible beauty man, beautiful man. He's terrible beautiful. He's ugly and beautiful. I love him, and he's a tough guy, and uh, I dig that. Pedro Meyer, I love you. Next one, James Nakwe, uh, who's most, be the most handsome guy in the world, I think. And it's amazing uh, to talk to James. Uh, because he's a, such a nice man. And also, I asked him, uh, when we have seen his, uh, the film about him, because he's, the film about James Nackway is a fantastic movie. But every day, he could stay in Rwanda for three months, and his shirt is clean, his jeans is clean, he's new shaved, he looked like a film star every day, never dirty, but what a guy. And I... When I started to take the, those photographs, I planned to do another thing, but suddenly I saw the beauty in his face. So I, th I thought, okay, that's it. I have to depend on his face because in that face, it shows something. And I talked about Gustav Mahler, the composer. And Gustav Mahler was married to the most beautiful woman in Vienna. Gustav Mahler died in 1911. And Alma Mahler knew that. And once uh, Gustav Mahler and Alma sat and had a lunch in a cafe in Vienna, a woman entered that was as beautiful as Alma. And Alma turned green. And she showed her was so jealous. And Gustav followed her with the face, uh, with the eyes. And then Alma said, oh, come on, Gustav. If she had been alone with you, you will have, what will you do with her? And then Gustav said, my dear Alma, it's no problem. Because in that face is for me uninteresting. Because there's no sign of suffering. And I think in James' wonderful face, it's a sign of suffering. Next, please. Anton Corbein. I actually also want to shoot a new photograph of Chris Rainier, who is present here, because I think the photograph I took of him is too sweet. I wanted to, uh, so I'm so happy that you are here, Chris. So hopefully you will give me 30 minutes. This is uh, Anton Corbein, uh, that also, like all the artists, shows some pain and loneliness, uh, because I think that is absolutely vital to, to create something. Next, uh, of course, I do got to do a lot here. Bruce Davison uh, looked like a grandfather on the, you know, on the holiday or something. But uh, uh, my really portrait of Bruce Davison is my close-up. I haven't got it here of the most beautiful camera in the world, a 60 years old Leica. Next one, and uh, it's Joel Peter Whitkin. I think he's an amazing artist. One of the greatest artists in the world, but I mean, what he's doing is horrifying. He had uh, a show now in Guggenheim in New York, and he's dealing with mostly about dead people, uh, inspired by Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, next one. And uh, it's a camera here, it's Elliot Irvitt. Uh, on the here is a Leica, but I will try to get it out in the dark room. This is just test prints. Okay, next, Mike Ribot. Next, and Don McCullin. I love that guy, and also love his face. 
uh, I suddenly found out that I forgot my best of my uh, photographer's portrait. Absolutely, it's William Klein. And I'm so happy that William didn't like it. He actually hated it. And I said, wow, good. I go for it. Next one. Somebody said it's me. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll talk a little about uh, my uh, photography. As all people uh, in my age, I was inspired by Life magazine. My mother and father subscribed on Life magazine. And I think that the reason I'm 90% of my work is black and white, and 90% of what I'm doing is uh, a darkroom thing. And uh, I, the best advice I got in the world was a Norwegian poet. He was a favorite to receive the Nobel uh, Prize, uh, Literature Prize now. It, uh, absolutely top of the top. And I photographed him in 1982 and listened to what he said. He said to me, Morten, you have a big problem in your photography, 1982. Your exposure time is too short. And I said, what are you telling me? Don't go in 250 seconds or 125. Go to one second. May, make time in photography. Go to five seconds. Go to minutes. Go to hours. Because you have to create time. And I thought, I don't agree with you, but you are more smarter than me. So I will listen to your advice. And after that day, I always use as long exposure as possible. Sometimes I do portraits for five minutes exposure, and my landscapes is 10 hours, my still lives is five hours, uh, etc. So this is not a long exposure, but it's, let's say, half a second or something, because then uh, you get the little, little move uh, in, in the light, so you show that the light is moving, and it's moving quite fast, I heard. Next one, please. Uh, this is my uh, earlier work. I work now a lot with dancers because my Rekve project is the main project I do. Uh, the project about things that is bigger than life. Uh, but as you can see, I'm very much into uh, sculpture. And I think one of the greatest experiences I had was uh, when I was invited by Henry Moore to photograph his sculptures in London. And that is... 20, 30 years ago, and I was so sh shy that I didn't dare to photograph him. But I received a huge uh, original drawing by him as thank you, and he said it's the best interpretation uh, of my sculpture ever. And I think that gave me a lot of feeling uh, that I want to create sculpture in my photography. I want to have clean, strong lines. Next, please. Uh, and I go, uh, and I want to also and learn about sculpture you, you, that you start uh, here and ends up that the whole power, the whole body must have the same power. And you can see that especially in the early work of uh, Jody Bieber. Uh, I've never seen. I mean, the people uh, playing, you know, with. Radios and dancing is a lot of power in all the frames uh, in her work. And, uh, but it's easier when I can direct them, okay? And also here, I try to do power. And all, very often I combine a studio flash uh, uh, indoors with long exposures. Uh, so I freeze the figure with uh, the flash and I expose the background. Uh, for two, three, four seconds to make the light uh, move, which I think is very necessary in my work. Okay? Uh, I tried the whole time to use, I love reflections, I love windows, I love dirty windows, I love rainy windows. Uh, I, uh, so, because I tried to s create a depth of feel in a way in uh, my images. Uh, the third dimension. Okay. Yeah. And of course, uh, portraits, it's very important uh, for me. This is uh, in Peru. I never, uh, I love the soft light. It's terrible to say it, 
But because of the pollution, the morning light in Dhaka is the most beautiful light in the world. Uh, get up here at 5 or 6, 5.30. Because if you have the soft gray light, you can do whatever you want to do in the dark room. If you have a harsh light, you have, uh, you have a problem. So I love soft lights and then uh, have a sort of a negative that I can do whatever I want to do with. Uh, for me, photography is, of course, about meetings, and it's about putting a sort of energy in a meeting between me and the sitter. I try to send my message from the camera to the sitter and back again. I use the Hasselblad uh, much because I don't want to cover my face when I uh, photograph. I use, of course, Leica and also 4x5 and 8x10, but I think the uh, Hasselblad, when I don't hide my face behind the camera, helps me to get the contact. Next, please. And I also uh, think that uh, to give a sort of it's terrible uh, scanning by me, not by <laughs> people from Pachala. Um, uh, but I'd like also uh, to give space, but it's so important that uh, if you have a lot of space and if you may make a mistake so that the space is not working, uh, then you have a problem. And when people ask me, how do you do it? And said, it's just a feeling. It's just feeling. I don't go after any rules at all. It's just a feeling by concentration, yeah. And this is in Eritrea, uh, when uh, just before the first rain in two and a half years, and these two sisters going, and you could see a little of sharpness here. I'm, uh, I'm running after them. And I think I exposed this on one fifteenth of a second or something. And suddenly, this note came blowing in the wind. Uh, and that was totally vital for, uh, for me. I have trained a lot with technique. I don't uh, bring a light meter anymore. I think it's 10 years since I've used a light meter because everything is uh, here. Uh, it gives me freedom to search for the quality of light instead of using time to measure the light. I work very fast, but I'm very, very patient when I'm working. I'm not a patient person when I have to queue up in an airport, when, but when I'm working, it's no problem. I love it. And I always try to search for the whole uh, combination, I mean, the whole composition. So when I saw that guy in Niger, uh, and he was working, I said to hello to him, I said, continue working. But the thing I saw was, of course, the dust here and the dust combining the clouds. So I put on the yellow uh, filter. But I saw it from the car. I saw the scene, and I tried to compose before I meet the person. I see the image, then I make in my head the composition so I can shoot very fast. Uh, I've always tried to be, uh, be in, in front so I know what to do before I meet people. Okay? Exactly the same here. That is it's a smoke combined with the sky uh, shot in uh, Peru. I think even how sad the situation is, I think humor is the best communication you can have in all countries in the world. People really appreciate that you are in good spirit. Okay? And this is in Kontiki Island, up in Titicaca Lake. There, I think I spent three hours with a boat to get that uh, photograph. But we communicated all the time, and um, I sent over a small bottle of red wine to them, and they were very happy. So I could use a long, long time uh, and wait for the light and wait for the, this hat to come precisely uh, where I want it. Some people criticize me that my photography is too, too much in order. And when people say that, I'm very, very happy. <laughs> OK? OK, uh, when I had one hour with Nels Mandela, uh, then you have to challenge yourself because you're meeting an icon. This is in 1994, I think, or 1993. And to spend one hour with, with a living legend, you have to, uh, to communicate on a quite high level, at least for me, that I'm a simple guy. Uh, but uh, uh, for me, to meet him and 
I always think that the people on the top are the nicest. I always think that the most generous people are the people that are really good at something because they have no, no reason to protect themselves or to, to, to talk rubbish or to be arrogant because they I think to be on the top you have to be humble. Okay? This is the singer Harry Belafonte, uh, which I did three years or four years ago. And I just put him uh, in the shadow in front of a background that, uh, and turn the camera to, I think, f stop four or something, and fade away the background. I don't want the background to be totally black. Just give it a little space. And then again, I depend on the face because he's an incredible, handsome man. So why do fancy things when you have a face like this? So I try to make a sort of a light sculpture. Yes? And then it's more into my Requiem pro project that is a long exposure times and try to get time into my photography. This is shot for uh, exposed for six hours during the whole uh, night, started around 11 o'clock uh, at night and had the shutter open about till seven in the morning. And I know the composition, I have a very heavy tripod and then uh, what will happen with the light, I don't know. So. I love to uh, that I don't want fully control. I love that I have a sort of control, but not full control. I take for granted that you understand that this is not pure white in the dark room. But in the morning, I woke up with a dream, and the dream was like this. So I went to the market and asked these three ladies to pose for me. And uh, they, they hopefully, uh, they hoped that they could have a chat but I said, you have to sit still at least for one minute. I shot it in one minute, uh, f-stop 64, because it was quite dark there. And you can see that she's so small that her foot is not reaching down the floor, to, to the floor. And they have to sit for, I took five exposure and one minute each. And uh, they asked me, but why should we not talk? And I said, because it's a dream. And then they said, OK, we respect that. And I also dreamt this reproduction by Leonardo da Vinci. And I love that the glass was broken. So that started uh, the whole Requiem series, OK? And of course, you know uh, that the white pale horse is the uh, symbol of death in nearly all countries. Uh, I don't know if you have seen uh, uh, the movie by Sean Penn, uh, Dead Man Walking. Uh, and when he's uh, going to uh, the gas chamber, the guards are cry, uh, shouting, dead man walking, it's a pale horse coming, dead man walking. Johnny Cash has sung, uh, had a song about the pale horse, but uh, most of the, uh, I mean, Henrik Ibsen, August Strindberg, uh, Shakespeare, write about death and pale horses all the time. I did that in Qatar. Uh, I was lucky enough to come uh, into this room. Again, of course, it's details all the, all the way. And I think if you work hard enough, you're lucky. Because when the horse came in, uh, for me, it was very vital to have this uh, hand uh, dressed in black, very vital. And suddenly, the sun came. I was so lucky, and the horse, for one second, lifted. Uh, the one leg, and I had it. So I think you are rewarded if you work hard enough, okay? And this is uh, Rosalia Lombardo, who died in uh, 1920, born in 1918. I photographed her in uh, Palermo. She died of a disease in 1920. She had an injection just before she died, wrote... Uh, uh, one of the principals in the monastery, and she's totally today uh, fresh, in, no rotten at all, and it's full of holes in the coffin. And I had to uh, pay uh, a thousand euro to go in there to, to photograph her, and they locked me in. It's eight thousand corpses there. And it's nearly totally dark, so I had to expose for about 45 minutes. I went up to a ladder and exposed her. And actually, this is one of my photographs that have sold uh, most. My recent show in uh, Oslo sold tremendous. 
And uh, I don't know why, but a lot of people buy that. I think it's because death is not very frightening when you see her. Yes? Uh, this is uh, from... Uh, 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 this is from... Uh, 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 the streets of Marrakesh. Uh, and I continue because in, in January, when the sun is high, and uh, 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 around 12 o'clock, some of the old people go around with uh, sort of huts on their head, and you can hardly see the faces. So I started in the bazaars to make compositions and just waited the people to arrive. Uh, and they just passed me. So I uh, tried to work on the composition with faces pure black, to, uh, so you couldn't see them. Next one, exactly the same here. So I did a series of that into my Requiem project. Uh, next one, please. And then I photographed uh, the, this young, beautiful person. We had him as a poster on the last Shubhamela. Uh, so it's quite boring for you to, to hear the story again, but somebody has, uh, some haven't seen it. Uh, I photographed him in, in Krakow. I went to a Jewish bookstore, and um, at, because he was displayed so many beautiful pho photographs in the window, photographs from the uh, 30s and 40s of Jewish people. And I talked with the manager there for a long time and, and saw all these photographic albums. And then he said, I can give you a key because on the top of this shop, uh, it's very, very dusty, but you will see two huge photographs hanging from the wall. And I came in there, and that was a photograph uh, that was totally clean. So I went uh, with the camera, and suddenly I got the re reflection from the window and uh, also from the curtain. Uh, so I, I tried to crucify him. Uh, so I did a reproduction of that photograph reflected in a window, and we displayed it uh, two years ago in Chubimela. He died in Auschwitz in 1943, and suddenly he, uh, he was over you know, the whole of Dhaka looking at us when he was dead long, long before uh, this country was <laughs> invented, goosebound, invented. So I have taken now contact with his family and uh, do, will do a project of his family that is still alive, that have never met him. And it's exactly the same with the next one. I'm soon finished. If you can go to the next one. This is the other photograph uh, that uh, was there. They don't know much about that person, but, but again, uh, it was the reflection. Uh, so I created a new photograph. For me, it reminded me of a person from Dostoevsky or something. Uh, Raskolnik, Raskolnikov or something it could be. Uh, so, and that's the last one I did before. Now I worked with this series for two more years. A digging and digging and a digging and trying to find a new way to, uh, to do this series, to continue the series with more abstract work. And uh, if the mighty Lord will and Shadul, I will come back in two years and uh, present my finished work because then I had to stop. I've done a lot of new uh, things and I'm going to work very, very hard in the next two years to finish that project. Just three more, I think. Uh, yeah, and this is also in the series that inspired by Andrei Tarkovsky. Uh, you, you know, that Russian fantastic filmmaker. Just horses in the field. The horses is not so important. Uh, it's horses moving in the field. So you can go to the next one. Uh, and that uh, just horses in the landscape. I'm also doing a series about horses, but the main focus is on the Requiem project. Next, please. Just three more photographs the, uh, from Rome. I, I did a huge exhibition. Uh, from Rome when I did uh, architecture stuff. This is in the middle of the night uh, when the fog came. It's very seldom, it's fog in Rome. Uh, but for me, it was very important to get rid of people. I don't want tourists. I wanted to create a timeless city without tourists. And when I saw this in Piazza Navona, suddenly it reminded me of a uh, Hitchcock movie or something. And because of the long exposure, I get rid of all the tourists. This is a maybe a couple of hours exposure. Uh, and then 
people can walk in front of the camera and they don't uh, they go into the film. So I think uh, for me, I want to, to show the timeless beauty of Rome. But also it's important when you do like this that you still have details up in the sky that you can see Bernini's uh, sculpture and uh, yeah. And you also have details here, who's living here, I think, who's living here. So I, I had an exhibition in the Museo di Roma, and for me it was a compliment that 42 Italian papers write the same, that it was a Nordic view, uh, the Nordic view to Rome. And I think that was for me a compliment that I saw that I'm from uh, Scandinavia, because uh, I think it's, I want to see Bangladesh photographers and understand that they are from this region of the world and that they're not from Paris or New York City. One more, please. And exactly the same here in Piazza Popolo, uh, the Piazza of the People. And uh, here is three exposure, one, one third of a second, just to have some cards there. And then a 20 minutes exposure. And then I waited for a couple of hours and I take one 20 minutes more. So I, the whole sky is moving. And the water, it was rainy, rainy, rainy. And a lot of people uh, went in front of the camera. They, they don't show. Because I thought that in front of this church, here, Mr. Goethe had been sitting drinking his wine. And here, Thomas Mann has been there. Henrik Ibsen has been there. Strindberg has been there. Franz Liszt has been there. And we are on the short visit on this planet, all of us. And we are soon gone. And it's where our children go there. And then our grandchildren. And the churches will stay there. And then I'm going to end with Pantheon. Uh, just say a couple of words at the end, but just you to show me the next one. Uh, and uh, when I w it's 2,000 years old, that building. The, maybe the most important building in the, in the West. I, in the West. Because Western people always said it's the most important writer or the most important artist. Uh, but suddenly they forget a continent called Asia. So uh, for me, it was vital that the only place you can understand uh, this column and the crosshair, that is uh, to have the crosshair, and the only window I could shoot it from was the foreign minister of Italy. So it took me f about six months to enter his house to get permission. And he was at home, and he thought I should take a snap out to the window. The exposure time was around three hours. And I failed, of course, I failed. So I tried to go back again, and then he wrote me a mail and said, okay, you can come, but I will not be home, <laughs> because I don't want you here for three hours. And when I shot it, I didn't see the moon at all. It was pure luck. Uh, just to end, because I guess you now are uh, tired and you're hungry, I will just add a very, very, few uh, word. Um, and that is, uh, this is, I've published eight, 18 books. And I guess that's 10 too much. But I've done it because I was uh, capable to do it. This is just a little drop of what I've, uh, I'm doing. Uh, just in a few words at the end, I think one of the, uh, the most important thing I tell my students is, if your camera breaks down, is, would you still be at the spot? And if you then think it's not worth being here, don't go there with the camera. For me, in the age of motorized cameras, I always said that my camera has the advantage to be slow because then I have to think. I don't, I don't want to rush when I uh, take photographs. I told my students today that if you get two minutes uh, permission to photograph a person, it's a long time. 20 years ago, uh, I thought, no, you cannot photograph if you have two minutes. You can do a lot in two minutes if you cool down and 
and uh, think because the camera can not uh, think. And to end uh, this, I just want to share a wonderful story with this one of my heroes, Andrei Tarkovsky, the filmmaker. The last film he did, he was 52 years old. Uh, and he got cancer. He didn't know that he was dying. It was one scene, his last scene ever. And because uh, a house burned down, uh, they had to rebuild it. It no, was no money left. So they had one scene, and it was a fog coming from the sea and into an island uh, in Sweden called Gotland. And he and Sven Nyqvist, Sven Nyqvist is the eye of Ingmar Bergman. He has done all the filming for Ingmar Bergman. They had to wait alone because they had no money. They waited five days, and then the fog came. And that should be the opening scene, the fog coming in with music by Johann Sebastian Bach. After one minute, and Sven thought, yes, it's there. And he moved the camera, and suddenly Tarkovsky went in front of the camera, turned it off, and he said, it's too beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Morton. Thank you. Uh, as ever, the energy coming through. Do we have some questions? I think tonight, yes, Nabil. I'm curious as to what you do while you wait for the three, six hour exposures. Very, very good question. Before I answer it, uh, Witold Lutuslawski, the Polish composer, I photograph him a lot. So, uh, it's a hundred years anniversary now in Warsaw. And they use my photographs for through all the labels. But he said to me, I have so many answers, but I miss the questions. Uh, I, it's lovely because I read, I write, I bring my notebooks and I think because then I have time to think because if you're doing visual arts you have to think and I turn off my mobile phone of course and I think write and read and it's wonderful sometimes I hide my camera and go I go for a drink <laughs> but a good question I do have a question, Morten. Oh, I mean, in, in your class, um, you're known to get people to sketch, listen to music, and of course, in, in your conversation, uh, we, it was, it's very apparent that there are these whole set of series of experiences that relate to uh, photography. Uh, so your photography emerges from that. It's not something that's out there on its own. What, and let me use a specific example. In terms of Muthi, he's a person who at that time did not speak a lot of English, probably didn't recognize many of the references that you made. What is it that you're able to do that brings out that transformation in someone like Muthi? Why did you use that mic? Because yeah. I think we'll be. This Again, a very good uh, question. I the thing they learn first, they learn from uh, sketching. I said, today we're going to sketch, uh, make a sketch of Leonardo da Vinci. It's, you have 20 minutes, and you really have to concentrate. And when I then tell my students, do you concentrate in the same way when, you, when you're doing photography? They all say, no, we don't. 
but you have to. The other one is that if we make a drawing of a famous piece of art, it, for the first thing, everybody can draw. It's amazing how good they are. This group of students we have now, it's better to, to draw than to uh, take photographs. But tomorrow it will come, I know. Uh, the other thing is that if it's 20 people, it's 20 different versions of Michelangelo or Leonardo. But if you take photographs of it, it will be totally the same. The only difference is that one is sitting there, one is sitting there. So the camera use, is used as a reproduction. And that is the reason that Pablo Picasso pointed to Brassai's camera and he said, Brassai, you have a fucking problem, and that's the camera. I absolutely agree. But the uh, thing uh, with uh, Muti, let's say Muti, it's to give him comfort, and when Muti sees a good photograph, and I said, take time, Muti, he immediately recognized it. He recognized quality, and then when he's encouraged to do something, I think for him it's a great gift, and he takes the gift uh, and appreciate it that much, so, and then his talent that maybe is way down is emerging. And I know that Muti has one wish, that his son is going to Pachala. That's his biggest ambition in life, that his son should be a photographer. Well, I was going to ask further questions, but I think with that ending, I don't want to damage that in any way. I do want to make some announcements, uh, but before that, uh, I'd like to thank Morton for this wonderful presentation and for what he's been doing repeatedly at Thank you, Morton.